Good morning, everybody. Hope everything is well where you are and everything is going great. We're uh, sitting here in San Antonio and well, I'll tell you the weather this week has been absolutely fantastic. Great. So, hope all is well. We're uh, continuing in our study on the, uh, on the Bible. Specifically, where's your Bible? And um, we're plowing through today in the, we're getting to the point now where historically in the uh, Satan's attack on the Bible, things begin to really start to focus in on the words of God, the, the Bible as such. I want to take just a, a couple of minutes here to go through the, the logistics of the Bible as such. The Bible, the New Testament, now when I'm talking about Bible now, we're, we're talking specifically New Testament at this point. The Old Testament had already been finished and completed uh, 400 years before Jesus was born. Uh, the Old Testament was finished and completed. The New Testament, obviously, is what we're referring to here. Um, that was written between the years roughly the late 30s, you know, 37, 38 AD, up until around 95 AD. So there's a you know, 50, 60 year period in there in which this uh, New Testament was written. And I don't know if a lot of new Christians ever think about it much, but I, I remember when I was a you know, brand new Christian, I just kind of figured that, okay, well, we, we've got the life of Jesus. He was condemned, he was crucified, he was resurrected and so forth. And he had his you know, 12 uh, apostles, you know, one of which blew it and uh, committed suicide, Judas. And then we've got the formation of the church. We've got Paul getting saved. We've got the epistles being written. We've got the gospels being written. We've got the book of Revelation being written. And I kind of, in my head, kind of lumped it all together that, you know, 15 minutes after Jesus had died and gone to heaven, that somebody started writing down this stuff immediately. But for most of the gospels, most of them weren't even started getting, you know, written till like, you know, 20, 25 years after Jesus had died and gone up to heaven. Paul, he started his epistles, you know, in around, in the, uh, in the 50s or so. So again, like, like a 20 year period after these events took place, these guys started to write this stuff down. And I think one of the reasons that, it, not that it took so long, but the fact that they did it anyway, they wrote it down, was that they could see that from the oral transmission of this stuff, you know, one person saying, yeah, I was with Jesus when he uh, walked on water. And they relate that story to the next generation uh, of kids or so forth. And then, then the next generation of kids. Yeah, well, I remember a guy who remembers because he was there and he saw Jesus walk on water. Well, now we're getting a little bit further and further from the source here. And so now exaggeration might start to creep in. Uh, embellishing the stories might start to creep in. Omitting certain things that are important started to take place. And so I think that as a group, you know, led by the Holy Spirit, that these guys said, we've got to start legitimizing this stuff in writing and putting it down on paper. And once it's on paper, now it's going to be a lot harder to change it, to amend it, add to it, and subtract from it. And so it seems like there's almost was a, a universal urgency that all at the same time, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all these guys started to write. Paul's uh, saved by this point. 
uh, 14, 15 years go by before the church finally accepts him as such. And so he begins to write his epistles uh, after he's taken off on his missionary journeys and so forth. So it was a very, very hectic time. And we, nobody had a Bible as such. Mark would write his gospel. Luke would write his gospel. Matthew would write his gospel. And these were sent to various churches at various times. And certain people had access to these things. Other people would make copies of them. And it was time consuming because it was all by hand. But nobody had a Bible as we know it. You had a gospel here. You had an epistle there. You had a, a letter to the church of uh, Philippians over here. You had a letter to the church of uh, Rome over here. You had a gospel over here. But it was really, really another 200 and some odd years before what we would know and classify and identify as a Bible would come into being. It was individual letters, individual gospels scattered here and there. So that first century, it was an unbelievably chaotic time from political reasons, uh, religious reasons, uh, a whole bunch of things were going on here. He had Jesus being born in his life. You know, 30 years, just regular guy. Boom, the Holy Spirit comes on him. He's ready for his ministry. He's got a three and a half year ministry. He picks the 12 apostles. Ends up with a crucifixion. Ends up dying. Resurrection comes. He spends another 40 days or so down here. Boom, he takes off. And now the church is basically on their own. So he's got the formulation, he's got the, the formative aspects of the church going, but th there's nothing really going on here as such. Pentecost comes. Peter gets up and he begins to preach. 3,000 people get saved in one lump. Next day he's out there and he's preaching again. 5,000 more get saved that next day. So now that church has a, you know over 8,000 people in a two-day period. It is going like gangbusters. Paul is not saved yet. Paul is still out. He's in the process of killing Christians, imprisoning them, separating families and so forth. After a few years, not very many, probably within three or four years of the uh, resurrection of Jesus, Paul gets saved. But after he gets saved, it is another 14 years before the church has anything to do with them because they simply don't trust him. He was their arch enemy number one. And then one day he shows up and he says, hey, I'm saved now, guys. I'm preaching the gospel. Trust me. No way they're going to trust him. So it took 14 years for Paul to gain the trust of the church. He goes off and he starts his missionary journeys. He establishes churches all over the Roman Empire, and then he begins to write letters addressing problems to these various churches. Some churches have lost their faith. They, they think they've missed the rapture. Uh, some churches get, uh, they, they want to go back to the law and circumcision and, and the Ten Commandment type scenario and so forth. So Paul sees the wheels falling off all over the place, so he begins to write letters to address these particular problems. At the same time, in 70 AD, now Paul is killed, he's beheaded by Nero around 66, 67 AD, someplace in there. Two years later, Israel, Jerusalem specifically, is burned to the ground by Titus and the Roman legions. The slaves from Jerusalem, some of them, are taken to Rome, of which they end up building the Colosseum in Rome. Israel as a nation is basically Finnish. They have no capital. They have no land. They have no flag. They have no identity. They are dispersed. 
throughout the world. And this lasts up until 1948. It's almost a 2000 year period. So that first 100 years or so of Christianity is an absolute powder keg of things going on. The Apostle John, at 95 years old, he writes the book of Revelation. He's the last living guy among this group, this first generation. So he writes the book of Revelation. And now, technically, the Bible is complete, but it's still scattered. It's still, you know, piece here and a piece there and a piece here and a piece there. And like I said, it's going to take another 200 years for them to, the church leaders would get together in what they refer to as synods, S-Y-N-O-D-S, or conferences, or big global meetings. And so the, the, the church heads of all the, the major sites of Christianity would get together for a two, three month period. And they would argue and debate over which gospels, which letters, which religious writings and stuff should be included in what would later be known as a Bible. And there was a lot of discussion. There was a lot of arguments. Should this particular gospel be in there? Uh, the book of Jude, they, they, they were almost having knife fights and stuff, whether or not to include the book of Jude in there. Paul's epistles, some people didn't like the tone of them. Some people didn't like being called out for various things. Some people didn't like to be called basically idiots because they had left the first love, because they had left the precepts of the teachings of Christ and so forth and were veering off into other heresies. And Paul would call them out on it. And so when it came time to include this particular epistle or that particular book, it was a knockdown, drag out fight for almost 200 years. Finally, in the early 300s, they fixated on a particular group of 27 books that were included in what we now know as the New Testament. You included those with the, 69, the 39 books of the Old Testament, and now you've got the 66 books of what we call the Bible. It was not an easy path. It was not a seamless flow. It was a knockdown, drag out fight for over 200 years to get this book. Jesus foretold that there would be problems like this. He said, you know, don't let guys deceive you. I mean, the first thing that's going to happen, you, you think you, your, your feet are on solid ground. Somebody's going to try to fool you. Somebody's going to want to pull a fast one on you. Somebody's going to want to introduce things in this book or add to my words that shouldn't be there. And for the first generation of guys, there was not really a big problem with that because a lot of these guys were still alive at the formulation of this stuff. They were the ones writing it. They had been eyewitnesses to the life of Jesus. They saw the miracles of the loaves and the fishes. They saw him walk on water. They saw him calm the seas. They saw him raise the dead. So that generation, there wasn't that big of a problem. But now you get to the next generation, who all they can do is say, oh, I knew the guy who saw the loaves and the fishes miracle. I saw the guy raised from the dead. And then you get another generation and another generation, and the further you get from the source of this stuff, the easier it is for heresy to creep in, for things to get changed. And that's exactly what Jesus foretold. That's what Paul warned about in his lifetime because it was happening in his day. Look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We've seen these verses before, but I just I want to hit them again real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. It says, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. 
but as of sincerity. But as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So in Paul's day, you've got many that are corrupting the words of God. Second Corinthians, look over in chapter 4. Look at verse 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, not handling the word of God deceitfully. He says some guys are handling the word of God deceitfully. And who would these guys be? It wasn't guys like Plato and Aristotle. It's Christians. So-called Christians, members of the church. These are the ones doing it. We go over in 2 Timothy. Chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter one, verse three. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing, I have re uh, remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Now I screwed up on that one. That's not the right verse. Truly, take the other two, one is in Corinthians. I'll sort it out later. But in Paul's day, you remember the verse that says, many shall come in my name. Some shall depart from the faith. The word of God is going to get mishandled. This is Satan's modus operandi from day one. Yea, hath God said. We've seen it over and over and over again. So Jesus foretold it. Paul said, hey, it's already happening. Years go by. And as I said at the beginning, we get to the point where the, the Bible is finally correlated into a book. We've got 27 books now in the New Testament. Got those sorted out. Heresy is running rampant. Satan has pulled out all the stops. He comes across one guy. This guy's born around the year 184. So he's a, a couple of generations, two or three little generations um, from the source. John was still alive in 95 AD. This guy comes along in 187. So it, it's not, you know, historically speaking, it's not that far away. This guy's name is Adamantius Origen. And he's living in Alexandria, Egypt. And he is going to come up with a scheme that was going to be absolute genius in its effectiveness. And of course, it's not him. It's Satan behind the scenes that, that does this thing. So it turns out that he says, let's not concentrate so much on the words of God. Let's concentrate on the meaning of these words. And that little shift in priority, made all the difference in the world because it was relatively hard. I mean, it, it was being done and it could be done, but it was relatively still hard to change the words because now they were written down. It wasn't just primarily an oral type thing. 
you know, at that point when the, the gospels hadn't been formally written down yet, the Paul's epistles hadn't been written down yet, it was still a verbal type scenario. That's relatively easy to change those. But once they had been written down in hard form, now it's a little bit harder to change it. So the solution was, let's not concentrate on the words themselves, let's concentrate on the meaning of the words. Now, you can change it however you want without really changing the word. You just change the meaning of the word. And let me give you an example today because we are living in a time and a place where this is so evident, this is so normal that we don't even recognize it. When I was a young kid, and I'm talking, you know, a young kid, not, not in my early 20s, but, you know, teenager and, and below that. The term gay, it always meant and it referred to somebody who is carefree, somebody who is happy, somebody who is exuberant, carefree, gay. Well, I'm the same guy, I'm the same generation. So in one generation, the word gay has completely turned in 180 degrees different. 180 degrees. Gay does not mean necessarily happy, carefree, exuberant. We all know what gay means now. Did we change the, the concept of what's talking here, uh, what we're talking about? No, we just changed the word, the meaning, to make it say whatever we wanted to say. Progressive. When I was a kid, Progressive means that you're, you're progressing. You're getting hopefully better and better. Uh, you've got more knowledge. You can make better choices. You're progressing. What does progressive mean now? And what does it stand for? It is definitely not that. We've got justice on the Supreme Court today who cannot give you a definition of what a man or a woman is. You see, we haven't changed man or woman as such. We just changed the meaning of these words. That, that's all we had to do. So a man doesn't necessarily mean man anymore. Woman doesn't necessarily mean woman anymore. It can mean whatever you want it to mean. You see how that door is open now to changing the Bible? Adam is still Adam. Eve is still Eve. Until... They're not. So definitions, meanings. Oh, don't even get me going on pronouns. The alphabet soup, you know, L, G, X, Y, Q, M, E, T, what? You, it, it just never ends. You can't keep up with this stuff. And so what origin started as a philosophical trip to mess with the word of God. It's still going on today in, in total, complete societal evolution. Everywhere you look, it's the same thing. Everything's out of whack now. You don't know what to call people. You don't know how to refer to them. You don't know what they want to be called. You're afraid that you're going to call them the wrong thing. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's just complete madness and stupidity that we're in. But that's exactly the condition that Satan wanted when it comes to the word of God. If you can't trust the definition of a man or a woman, how in the world are you going to stumble through this book with the complexity and the layers that this thing brings to the table? You're not. So you just give up and you just let somebody else do it. Well, Origen had a school. He was the head of a school of which he trained would be preachers, teachers, professors, the whole bit. His idea was the Bible is so complicated 
and you're too stupid to get it. Therefore, you need somebody to explain this stuff to you. Because the Bible is basically one great big allegory, one big symbolism type thing. In other words, words don't mean what you think they mean. Hell doesn't necessarily mean hell. Heaven doesn't necessarily mean heaven. Good, evil, they can mean whatever you want them to mean. You're too stupid to get it. So you need somebody who's really, really smart to walk you through and explain what are the allegories, what is the symbolism. Jesus spoke basically and taught in nothing but parables. That and we looked at that last week. That's the only style he used in teaching was parables. Well, parables are analogies. They're stories. They're representative. They mean different things. And you're too stupid to get it, he says. So you need somebody who's really, really sharp to tell you what this analogy is, what this symbolism means, what the definition of this is. And guess who is better than anybody to lead you down that path? Adamantius Origen. And he affected the entire generation, the entire Christian world with his philosophy. You know what he did not believe? Let, let, let me just give you a little background on good old Origen here. He did not believe in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. You know, which starts out in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. God said, let there be light. In the beginning. All that is representative. He believed in evolution. He was influenced by Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and these guys. And the Greeks back in the third century BC, second century BC, they were all evolutionists. And so he just took that thing and he took the literal aspect of a literal God creating a literal this and that and so forth and saying certain things that literally took place. No, 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 no. It's all just representative. It's all just allegory. Yeah, we have an earth here now, but it didn't get here because somebody spoke it into existence. Are you nuts? That doesn't make any sense at all. It's all an evolutionary type thing. It's all a progressive growing type thing. So he didn't believe in the first three chapters of the Bible. Uh, he definitely did not believe that the sun was created on day four. He really made a big stink about that because it didn't make any sense to him because the plant life came before the sun came. And how can he have plant life before he have sunlight? He couldn't get his head around that. And technically, when you get right down to it, the plant life was made on day three and the sun comes out on day four. That's one day. Plants can go with more than one day without sunlight. I mean, how many days do we have cloudy days and rainy days and stormy days and so forth? There's no effective sunlight coming through as such to nourish that plant. So his whole concept was he, he was not a believer. He didn't believe the words of God. He didn't believe the Bible as such. So every chance that he got he denigrated it, poo-pooed it, shuttered it away someplace, and just said, fooey on it. He did not believe in a literal serpent talking to Eve face to face. It's all symbolic. You've got the nature of good, you got the nature of evil. Well, evil won out that day. And Adam and Eve blew it. 
And therefore, now, you know, we need a redeemer. We need to get born again. We need to get saved and stuff. We're, we're, we're sinful. But it's not because anything took place in a literal fashion. This is all just symbolic type stuff. There is no literal servant talking to a literal woman in that sense. He did not believe in Matthew chapter 4, the literal temptation of Jesus from Satan. I'm talking on a face-to-face -face basis here. And there's one verse in that passage that says that Satan took him. It doesn't mean grabbed him and, you know, forced him type thing. But he took him and placed him on a pinnacle of a temple. You know, one of the, the parapets, one of the, you know, the, the high points, the spires of the temple there in Jerusalem. And said, so, you know, throw yourself off. Because it's written that, you know, God won't let you hit the ground, that the angels will come and save you and so forth. But Origen didn't believe in any of that literalness of that event taking place at all. It's all symbolic. He definitely did not believe in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is basically all symbolic. It is symbolic about real things. When it says, you know, an angel came out of the Euphrates River and did this, that, and the other thing, the angel came out of the Euphrates River and did such and such, whatever it said he did. When it said the earth, you know, the moon turns to blood, it turns to blood. When it says that all, all the creatures in the ocean die, they all die. But in Origin's world, it's all symbolic. None of this really, really happened. It's just indicative. But do you know one of the, some of the things that he did believe in? As I said a second ago, he did believe in evolution. He did believe in things like universal salvation. You know what that is? Universal salvation means even if, even Satan, as, as bad as you are, let's say you, you die and let's say he didn't believe in it in a literal sense, but let's say that you do go to hell. It's only going to be a temporary thing because God himself cannot retain that, that anger or that rage, or that discipline to keep a human being in an eternal hell? You know, a year, five years, a thousand years, okay, I can get that. But an eternal hell? No, 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 no. Origin poo-pooed that one. Can't be. That's not right. So in other words, everybody eventually, now you might have to go to purgatory, you might have to go to limbo, you might have to go even to a, a temporary hell, if there is one, duh. But after a while, everybody gets out, everybody gets saved, everybody has eternal life, everybody has their little harp and their little cloud and their little rainbow and so forth. And everybody is happy as pigs and sloths. He didn't believe in that kind of stuff. He did believe in baptismal regeneration. You know what that is? That means that you have to get baptized in order to get saved. It doesn't matter how good you repent. It doesn't matter how you turn from your sin. It doesn't matter if you've asked Jesus to come into your heart to give him your life. You know, whatever term you want to use, for that process of salvation as such. You can do all those things. You can repent, you can be sorry, you can turn a new leaf, you can change your ways, you can make restitution, you can do everything, but you have to get baptized in that process or none of the rest of it works at all. That's baptismal re regeneration. He believed in the reincarnation. Everybody's going to get a second chance. Hence, after you've spent some time in hell or purgatory or limbo and so forth, 
and you get resurrected again or reincarnated again, more technically, then eventually, boom, you get to a point where you don't have to worry about it anymore. So his whole analysis was, you're too stupid to figure out this book. You need somebody who's really, really smart to figure it out, and I'm your boy. Listen to me. So he just went through, and he changed the meaning of the words. She was. What else did he do? Well, he promoted things like sign of the cross. We all know he's famous for that one. Uh, he was into nuns. You know, the, 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 the woman side of the, the clergy and such. He was really, really big on baby sprinkling, you know, baptizing little babies. Because initially, you know, they come out as sinners. And so, you know, first two, three, four days, whatever, you know, that, that week, you got to get them baptized. You got to get them sprinkled to get rid of original sin. You believe in all that kind of stuff really good. He believed in the, lit the liturgy. Liturgy is just a fancy word for all the, the pomp and ceremony that goes on in a lot of religious groups. Special robes. Special hats, you know, for the, for the clergy. Uh, special little, you know, the, the little cross around here. Uh, the, the little pots that you burn the incense in and you wave as you're walking down the aisle and so forth. Uh, the candles. Confession. The kneeling, standing up, kneeling, standing up, kneeling, standing up. That whole thing. The liturgy. The whole panorama of the drama that goes on the mass only spoken in latin that you know 99 point a hundred percent of your parishioners don't understand the liturgy he was really big on that confession certain holy days kissing somebody's ring bowing down Kissing somebody's feet. Gee whiz. This goes on and on. Mention confession. Honoring or venerating or worshiping is a more technical term. The saints. Saint Bartholomew, Saint Thomas. St. Jude, I and mean, the list goes on and on and on. There's a million of them. We wear little crucifixes around our necks and so forth. We have little rosaries and beads and so forth. He's into all this stuff. This is all transported from the old Babylonian mystery religions that started way back at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 9. That's how long this stuff's been around. And he was a big promoter of all this stuff. I wonder what denomination gravitated to all this stuff that we just mentioned here a second ago. You know, the sign of the cross, the nuns, the baby sprinkling, the liturgy. The incense, the bowing down, the kissing of the ring, the kissing of the statues, confession, holy days. I wonder what religion gravitated and solidified all this stuff into a working religion. Hmm. Can you spell Catholic? This whole concept of where's your Bible? 
it is a really, really integral part of the whole spiritual aspect of life here. We, we've been on this thing for nine weeks now. Nine weeks. I'm only up to origin. Now, I, I doubt it's going to be nine more weeks uh, on this you know, on this train of thought here. But do you see how all-encompassing this thing is? My original premise was, where's your Bible? In other words, I, I said that in the light of the fact that we've got like 200 different versions on the market today. 200 separate versions of the Bible, which are all saying different things, hence a different version. They're not all the same exact thing, word for word, or why well, have 200 of them? They're different because they're saying 200 different things here. So where's your Bible? Which version have you gravitated to? Which one do you think is the word of God? Because they all can't be right. Not even most of them can be right. If they all say different things, only one of them can be right. It's just common sense. You can't have a right here and a right here and a right here and a right here. That, that's not how life goes. And so we've seen in all these weeks, getting up to this thing where you're going to have to make a determination or maybe make a choice, gravitate to one and just stick with it. All the preamble stuff, all the drama that goes into this thing. How did we get to the point where we have multiple versions? How did we get to the point where one guy says one thing and another guy says another thing and another guy, a third guy says a third different thing? And so we went back to the beginning. Satan in the Garden of Eden with that one memorable line. Yea, hath God said. And that kicked the whole thing off. And we're still asking the question, yea, hath God said? Because I got a version over here that says one thing, and I got a version over here that says a different thing, and I got another version over here that some, says something else. So which is it? Yea, hath God said? Pick one. As the Bible says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If you can't come to a conclusion on the word of God of all things, then you've got a real problem. And so we go through, you know, the parables. We go through the, the beginnings of, of the writing of the word of God, how it goes from an oral thing to a written thing. We went over for week after week about the fact that you, it's, it's almost hard to tell sometimes the difference of the living word and the written word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Well, you're getting on a slippery slope right now when you start going, going down that path. What are you really saying? And so we took a few weeks on that. And, and I'm, I'm trying to get this foundational thing so that when we get to the point of when these guys actually started to veer off from each other in the written word, how we got to that point. Because in the next week or so, we are going to start to see a real veering off. One side is going to go up to Rome, and the other side is going to go up to Antioch and Syria. And from those two sources, the Bible as such is going to get disseminated around the world. The problem is, going out the gate, there are two sources. The one source is going through Wrote from Alexandria, Egypt to Rome. Boy, that's an encouraging thing. The other goes from Jerusalem up to Antioch. And you know what the book of Acts says? They were first called Christians in Antioch. So you got Alexandria to Rome, the bad side. You got Jerusalem 
to Antioch, where they were first called Christians. And that line of Bibles came through. They're going to converge at some point. And there's going to be dozens and dozens of dozens of people killed and martyred because they translated it from one side or they translate they either translated it from the Roman side or they translated it from the, the line that came down through Antioch. Christians or the Catholics. You got your choice here. I'm sorry, you make it that blunt and that that precise. But at the end of the day, that's what it boils down to. And we're getting to the point now, we're getting into the real heart and the meat of this thing, because now people are going to start to die for their convictions. Other people are going to be persecuting them for their convictions. One side is going to take precedence. The other side is going to take a subservient aspect. One side is going to be filled with money, power, glory, opportunity and everything else the other side is going to be denigrated into second class citizens they're going to be persecuted they're going to be hounded they're going to be killed they're going to be martyred the other side is going to have all the money all the prestige all the publicity all the star power all the name power and everything else and isn't it amazing that once these two sides have been settled into that the predominant side is going to bring in the bad guys, the ones from Alexandria going up to Rome, when they finally get settled in around the 6th century or so forth, and the Roman Empire is done and completely kaput and so forth, and this one side takes over. Gee whiz, what do they usher in? The age of wonderness, the age of Greatness, the age of glory. No, history calls it for the next thousand years. The worst period of human history, the dark ages. That's what it's referred to in the history books. That thousand year period between the ascendancy of Rome and the Protestant Reformation, that thousand year period. And it's in that thousand year period when all these translations and so forth begin and have their chances. And we'll start to get into that the next week. All right, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you that through it all, through all the drama, through all the setbacks, through all the, the stuff that we, we go through here, that you've never lost, you've never lost anything. This turned out exactly as you saw it was going to turn out. Nothing catches you by surprise. Nothing takes you unawares. You saw it all. All things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Lord, I know that some people, this whole subject matter, it doesn't really interest them because it doesn't make them money. It doesn't help them in their relationships, maybe with their kids or their wives or their bosses. It doesn't help them, uh, you know, get on in life as such. I get that. I know our priorities are all totally screwed up. I, I get that too. But mine are half the time. But I also know, Lord, that if there's one anchor that we need in our lives, if there's one bedrock that we need in our lives, if there's one foundation that has to take precedence over everything else, it's not our discussions on baptism, whether the dunking or sprinkling. It, it's not on the peripheral stuff of what pronouns we're, we're going to call each other. If there's one thing that we have to get settled in our own hearts and minds, that is what constitutes the word of God. And until we get that one really settled in our hearts, we've got some big, big problems. 
And so Father, why, while this might not be for most people the most interesting type thing, it might be more of a historical, boring type thing. Uh, Lord, Lord I, I can't really relate to that because to me, this is the foundational aspect of everything. If I don't have a book that I can trust, if I don't have a book that I can believe, if I have a book that I have to second guess and wonder and start scrambling around to a dozen other different copies or versions to, to find a verse that I can cherry pick that is going to make me feel better about a particular subject, then I'm really in trouble. I have to have a book that I can believe and trust and not have to second guess and not have to cherry pick other versions to find the verse that suits me and makes me feel better. So, Father, I pray today that you would instill that same urgency to those that are listening today. That's my biggest prayer right now in Jesus' name.